If you happen to see these signs, if you happen to witness this age, then know that the Qa'im, the Mahdi, will be knocking on your doors. Travel to him through the clouds. Travel to him even if you have to crawl on ice. Go to him even if you are locked in a box. Break out of that box. Even if you are trampled dead, then arrive to him. I seek refuge with God from the accursed Satan. In the name of God, the one, the conqueror. Wasallallahu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad ila imma wal mahdiina wa sallim taslima. And may God send his prayers and blessings upon Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, the Imams and the Mahdis. Today, my brothers, we're going to talk about the times that we're living in. Uh, since we are claiming that uh, Imam al-Mahdi uh, has appeared and that Imam al-Mahdi, Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Askari uh, is with us and that this is the time of the rise of the Qa'im and the age of his da'wah and the age of the Raja. And we want to discuss the, the world and the signs of this time. I don't want to say it's the signs of the end times and the meaning of the end of the world because that's not true. But it is the signs of the end of the world of Iblis, the end of the age of his rulership uh, on the earth. And the narrations from Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, they mentioned uh, that there would be uh, this period where it would be the state of Satan. It would be Satan's rule on the earth. And this is from the time of Adam and his exit from the Garden of Eden and until the time uh, that God, that appointed time that Satan told God or asked God that he would like for him to grant him respite till or time until, right? Or to delay his punishment until. And that's the, the hour, judgment day, uh, the day of the rise, Yom al Qiyam or the Qiyam of the Qa'an. So there's this misconception too that the Muslims have, uh, Sunni and Shia. Uh, a lot of the verses and the narrations that are talking about the day of judgment, uh, Yom al Qiyamah, uh, the, the Sunnis understand it differently than the Shia. The Sunnis understand the day of judgment as being this day where um, in the end of the world, after the world's totally destroyed and all of humanity is standing before God, God rises on his throne and then he proceeds to uh, judge all mankind. And uh, this uh, understanding of the day of judgment happening in the hereafter um, is nullified by Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, السلام, whom have explicitly stated that Yom al Qiyamah, in most of the verses in the Quran, refer to the day of the rise, Yom al Qiyam, Yom Qiyam al Qa'im, the day of the rising of the riser, uh, in which he judges uh, mankind and God judges mankind for. Uh, everything that they have done and the punishments come down and the age that is mentioned in the book of Revelation and in the narrations of Muhammad and the family of Muhammad So what have the narrations in Islam, Christianity and Judaism said about this time, this particular time period? What would it, what would the world look like? What were the people to expect in this day and age? One, uh, the Ahl al-Bayt said that Islam would be lost, that the mosques would be empty of guidance. And I don't like calling them mosques. I only use the term because it's the term that's familiar with the people. But the word mosque 
actually came from when the enemies of Islam wanted to mock the Muslims. And so they uh, used to refer to them as mosquitoes. And from the word mosquitoes came the word mosque, but it's actually um, a masjid, a place of prostration. Uh, the Prophet said that these places of prostration, these masajid, would be empty of guidance. And that the Muslims would call themselves Muslims, but they would be the furthest thing from it. Um, that nothing would remain from the Quran except for its calligraphy. And nothing would remain from Islam except for its name. Uh, the masjids in that time would be basically decorated with gold and silver and all of these things. And you find that in today's world, you find the masjids being the opposite of what they were in the time of the Prophet Muhammad. In this day and age, you find masjids that are built in countries like Dubai and Qatar and the Gulf countries that are decorated with ornaments made of gold and silver and precious stones, masjids that its construction costs millions upon millions of dollars. You find the same thing occurring in, the, uh, in Western countries, but much more in the Middle East. You find that the narrations of Muhammad and the family of Muhammad described also that the scholars would be traitors. And you find that also has come true. And there are dozens upon dozens of narrations which mention that. And we know that it's true because uh, you find all of these scholars of Islam, preachers, imams, so-called imams, and jurisprudence making the halal haram and the haram halal, issuing fatwas that are of ridiculous natures, everything from making permissible the ability to fornicate with infant children, uh, just like Khomeini did in one of his fatwas, to the scholars in countries like Afghanistan and Pakistan who have made it permissible that older men fondle and abuse young men uh, under the name, you know, under different cultural, uh, you know, disguises and excuses. You find the scholars making it permissible to consume even human corpses. You find these scholars making it permissible to fornicate and, and uh, with men and with women, especially if you're in a time of jihad, they say. That if you're in a time of jihad and you're on the battlefield, and many of these fatwas were issued uh, and they were actually used by many of these uh, terrorist organizations and their, and their followers, the likes of ISIS and other than them. Uh, they made a special form of jihad called the jihad of nikah, in which they encouraged women to use their bodies to, um, you know, to, to make jihad in that way by giving pleasure to the soldiers, these uh, terrorist soldiers that are out on the battlefield um, that are, uh, you know, fighting in the so-called cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so we find religion being like this putty uh, in the hands of the scholars. Uh, they issue fatwas left and right. They even issue fatwas in the countries, always in support of the tyrannical Arab leader that is oppressing their, their people. If the, if the people are starving to death, it doesn't matter. The imams will go on the member on the platform at the local mosques and say that it is obligatory not to go out and protest against the, uh, the leader, that this is haram, the Prophet Muhammad would be upset, you're going to go to hellfire, etc. And they would scare the people in line supporting the oppressor against the, the people. You have the scholars in Saudi Arabia flip-flopping their opinion every other day. 
One day they are issuing fatwas that allows the government to execute and behead and commit all kinds of uh, human rights offenses against anybody that would drink alcohol or that would watch pornography or that would be uh, women that would be seen driving in public or a woman that wouldn't wear the head veil or the headscarf. And the next day you find them you know, under MBS, because the ruler now changed his mind. So obviously God changes his mind too with these uh, tyrannical rulers. And they issue a fatwa that gambling is permissible, alcohol is permissible, Beyonce and her dancing on stage is permissible, concerts are permissible, and they're making a revamp and reinventing reinventing the kingdom and the religion of Islam. So obviously the scholars were not true to religion, but they were true to the tyrant. And the Prophet Muhammad and his family said, if you see the king or the ruler leaning towards and kneeling before and taking the opinion and obeying the scholar, then say yes to the scholar and say yes to the ruler. But if you see the scholar leaning at the doorsteps, bowing, prostrating, obeying and listening and hitting the drums for the ruler, then say no and woe and, and send your curses upon the scholar and declare yourself innocent of both of them, the scholar and the ruler, because they're bad. So those signs have appeared. Those signs have become true. The narrations also mentioned that in the time of the appearance of the Mahdi, that children would be out of control and they would be cursing their parents and rebelling against them. They also said that it would be a day where men would resemble women and women, women would resemble men. And you find this, you find a very big push, um, you know, and we're not talking here about homosexuality. I mean, forget about that. We're talking about this overall agenda to feminize the male and to make the female more masculine. And, and you even have now companies that are providing makeup. They're making, they're designing special makeup for men and the types of clothes that is made for men nowadays is, uh, is designed to make them look more feminine and vice versa. For the women, they're encouraged to be uh, more masculine. So that's another sign that, uh, you know, was prophesized and it became true. Uh, Imam Ali salam, he mentioned that in these days, uh, iron would travel on iron or iron would walk on iron. And people didn't understand that for, for a thousand years. And now we see it being fulfilled with the train, the invention of the, of the train, which is an iron machine that is, that is traveling upon iron. You have the narration stated that, that in those times, traveling between countries would be extremely easy and that the man, man would, would have a, a certain thing that he would keep on his hip and he would be able to take it and, and see or hear or speak to his brother, even if he was in the West and his brother was in the East instantaneously. And obviously, Muhammad and the family of Muhammad were describing the telephone. And uh, there's also narrations that say that the Qa'im will have a mailbox in which anybody from around the world would be able to um, communicate with him instantly. And now we have the email, right? Uh, you have everything from narrations where Imam Ali salam had mentioned that the, and described in great detail the conditions of the different peoples that would exist around the world in the end times. And there was a, a book that was compared Compiled. It was it was called What Does Imam Ali Alayhi Salam Say About the End Times? And in it, the author had gathered all of the narrations, not all of them, but a great number of the narrations, and he divided them by country and he lists the different things that Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, especially Imam Ali Alayhi Salam, said about the end times and pertaining to these countries. Uh, you have him describing that 
the people of South America, and in particular Brazil, that they would be obsessed with a game. Uh, the game was uh, that they used to kick back and forth, that they would be kicking back and forth and playing with something which resembles uh, an ostrich egg. And an ostrich egg is something which is round and large, and we find them now in South America and Brazil being obsessed with the game of soccer, which didn't exist in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, in the time of Imam Ali. So they were using these words to describe things and concepts and ideas and inventions that didn't exist at, you know, uh, at that time with those, with those people. And so all of these minor signs, and there's a plethora of them that are available, you know, um, everything from crime rising uh, to there being uh, instant killings before uh, death was not instant. Now with, with, with the manufacturing of, of high-tech weaponry like guns and things of this nature, um, death is instant. You get shot, you die. As to where before uh, you would get cut with the sword, you might get infected, you might die. Much later you get poisoned, you might die. Much later um, you have battle wounds, you, you know, or even just even if you died in the battle, it's like you're, you're fighting for a long time before the death uh, comes upon you, right? Uh, as to where it's different uh, in this day and age. So they described the the state of technology being more advanced. They even described jets and, uh, and uh, creatures that fly, that are made of iron, that are like flying donkeys, you know, because the, the, uh, the wings of a plane are like the extended ears of an animal that's flying in the sky. They described those things and said that... Um, that they would exist. They mentioned that the companions of the Qa'im would travel through the clouds. And we know now that people can travel through the clouds uh, through airplanes. Uh, the Qa'im was described as descending in domes that travel through the sky. So obviously there's references to, um, you know, travel by air and travel by sea already existed at that time and advanced fast methods of transportation um, by land. Uh, we have more specific uh, narrations that talk about, um, you know, the death of King Abdullah, for example, as being a very close sign. And we've mentioned that in several episodes. And we, um, you know, in the Shia used to always speak about that narration. And that narration was fulfilled to a T um, in the death of King Abdullah. Uh, because the narration says that basically there will rule Al-Hijaz, a man whose name is the name of an animal. And he was described as being cross-eyed from afar. But if you get close to him, you don't see anything in his eyes. And that he would be succeeded by a brother of his whose name is Abdullah. And that brother would have a big problem with the Shia. Uh, to the point that three woes were sent against Abdullah or the Shia were warned three times against him. And then it said that if he dies, then uh, the Qa'im would appear or the Hajjah would appear. And that's exactly what we saw happen. We saw a man, Rul Hajaz, whose name was Fahd. Fahd means leopard. He was succeeded by somebody who was not supposed to succeed him, his, his brother Abdullah. And Abdullah... Um, you know, was very much against uh, the Shia and had an agenda against them. And uh, and after his death, that's when the appearance of the Hajjah took place. And that's one of the uh, close signs. We have another important sign, and that is the the sign of, of wars and rumors of wars increasing um, around the world. And uh, the people are described uh, in the Bible uh, when, when, when the narrations and the, and the words of Jesus are speaking about or the visions are talking about the end times, you know, the time of the appearance of, uh, reappearance of Jesus and the time of the appearance of the Mahdi and the time of the punishment, it says that uh, the people in those times would be oblivious, and that they would resemble very much so the people in the time of Noah. 
who would still be getting married, married and playing and having children and going out to the field and working. And they are oblivious of the fact to the fact that there is a punishment that's coming. And, uh, and that's exactly what we see the people in today. Even though all of these signs are occurring and are taking place, most people on the planet are totally oblivious, even though it's happening in front of their own eyes. You have uh, a state that the world has never seen before, and it is continuing to become worse. Every single television station has been reporting that uh, the world is about to enter into a third world war. And that if a third world war happened, it would be a nuclear war. It would be a war that, and an, and an event on the planet that would be, uh, you know, an extinction level event. Because human beings have more weapons today than they have ever had in the history of mankind. They have enough weapons to destroy the entire planet and wipe it out of our solar system hundreds of times over. You have weapons that have the capability of fulfilling prophecy by blacking out the sun. Uh, nuclear clouds that can result of a nuclear war that would cause the earth to be in total darkness as a result of that. You have surahs and hadiths that prophesize exactly that taking place. And right now, what do you have? You have Russia, which is a nuclear power, and it's going to war. Uh, it is in war and has been for a while now against Ukraine. And you have the United States and the West, uh, NATO, the European Union, uh, in a proxy war against Russia. The real war is between these nuclear powers. And Russia has already threatened, and people have already threatened on Russian television, that they would nuke and destroy the United Kingdom and wipe it off the map. And you have threats from the opposite side towards them. You have news stations, news reports that just came out in the last uh, few days that mentioned the leaking of, of uh, files, uh, top secret files, uh, German files that were printed in one of the German newspapers that stated that the, the, there's an intelligence report that reported that... Um, Russia was planning to launch a full-scale war against NATO in 2025. And for that reason, uh, Germany and the EU countries are preparing and already doing war games and scenarios uh, in preparation for a possible attack from the Russians on NATO soil. Uh, you have Sweden making it mandatory now. Uh, and telling its citizens we have to be prepared and making it mandatory that even residents, uh, not even Swedish citizens, but even residents, that they would be drafted or possibly drafted in, uh, uh, you know, an event that a war uh, took place because of uh, their recent application uh, to go into uh, NATO. You have the European Union also having great fears. Uh, because they feel that the United States has um, left them or will be leaving them uh, once Trump gets elected back into office. And that's what all the polls are indicating, uh, that he's going to come back and that he is not going to stand by NATO or by the European Union and that it's possible that the EU finds itself in a gigantic, possible, a possibly nuclear war against uh, Russia and its allies. You have the whole world being divided into two. You have Russia allying itself with um, China and with Iran and with North Korea. And you have threats that are coming out of North Korea. And North Korea is stating that South Korea is the enemy and that there will never be peace between them. Threatening South Korea, threatening Japan, uh, threatening the United States, putting out videos uh, showing uh, 
new, what, a, what, a, what a North Korean nuclear attack on the United States would look like. Um, you have Iran, whom just uh, uh, just in the in the past hours has uh, launched an attack into Pakistan. Uh, they've struck Pakistan and destroyed some targets over there, saying that they will never stop um, attacking different targets all over the world until the war in Gaza stops. And you have Pakistan launching an attack on Iranian soil uh, in response to that, hitting different targets that they have uh, in Iran. Uh, you have every day on the news, they're saying that the Middle East is volatile and that it is about to explode into a full scale war after uh, the war that is ongoing between the Palestinians and the Israelis that are in the, le in the region. Uh, after the Israelis have struck uh, Syria, uh, there has been ongoing gunfire that's taking place at the borders and missile attacks uh, from both sides uh, between the Israelis and between the Lebanese. Hezbollah. And so what we're seeing is the beginnings of what could be the most devastating event that mankind has ever seen. In Armageddon, so to speak, a fulfillment of prophecy, a gigantic war in which the whole world gathers against the Mahdi. But first, before that, they gather all of them in the Middle East uh, to fight. And that's what we see, um, you know, in the prophecies. And that, that's what we're seeing uh, on the ground today. We see that Jesus spoke about, and Muhammad and the family of Muhammad spoke about how in the end times, time would speed up. And that a month would feel like a week and a week would feel like a day. And a day would feel like an hour or a moment. And that is a sign that nobody on the planet can deny. Time has sped up so much so that everybody that you talk to, no matter what their background is, no matter what their religion is, uh, maybe they don't even believe in prophecy or they don't even believe in God or they're unaware of the prophecies, they feel it. They say, my life is flying by. And the reason for that is because the tribulations become so hard and so heavy that uh, Jesus said that if it wasn't for time speeding up, even the elect, the chosen, would not be able to bear um, the punishments that would, that would be coming down upon the earth. You have the news saying that we are going through, they've said it openly, the scientists, they're saying that we're going through a fifth mass extinction. The scientists, okay, the world's so-called smartest people have all come forward and they're saying, hey world, we want to say something from a scientific perspective, not from a religious perspective. The earth, you remember when the dinosaurs went extinct? Remember? Yeah, that's happening right now, actually. It's repeating itself. It's taking place right now. And nobody seems to care. They're all focused on the Super Bowl. They're all focused on the, the Kardashians. So they're all focused on the television entertainment. And they're focused on their own lives and their, their money-making schemes that they have going on. And they have, they're, they're, they're exactly like the people in the time of Noah. Noah's telling them, there's a flood that's coming. The clouds are gathering in the sky. There's something in the air. The animals are all boarding the ark in front of their own eyes. And even as that is happening, mankind is oblivious and uh, just playing asleep. Same thing is happening right now. The scientists are saying that diseases that have the ability to possibly wipe out all mankind, old diseases and new diseases, and diseases that were frozen in the ice. All the ice is melting, and these diseases are going to be unleashed and are going to attack you. And we have no idea 
what it is that they do. Gigantic worms and parasites and viruses, uh, things that used to infect dinosaurs, they might be unleashed upon uh, mankind. And mankind is not listening. And in fact, diseases have been unleashed on mankind. And the whole world saw the prophecy of Imam Ahmed al-Hassan salam come true because after the reappearance of Imam al-Mahdi in 2015, everybody who's a believer in this call, they remember that one of the first things that Ahmed al-Hassan salam said, he said that there was going to be an event that's going to take place that's going to make the whole world stand still. And lo and behold, only a few years later, all of the flights were grounded, all of the businesses were shut down, all of the governments and the hospitals and everything else shut down and were, were, were disabled because of the sheer amount of deaths and people that were infected with the COVID coronavirus uh, plague that is still ongoing till this very day that it has infected almost every single man, woman, and child uh, on the planet and has taken the lives of millions upon millions of people. Well, the book of Revelation said that there will be plagues that will come upon humanity. And here we see a plague coming upon humanity. The, the Bible and the narrations said that there will be uh, wars and rumors of wars. And here we have wars and rumors of wars. Biblical prophecy, as well as the narrations of Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, stated that one of the signs of the end times would be uh, um, would be great droughts and heat, hot weather, and we find now that we have this global warming that's all over the news, saying that the world has seen record temperatures. It is exactly word for word fulfillment of the. Words of the prophets and the messengers and the vice chairs. You have the Bible and the narrations talking about time speeding up, immoral people, killings, um, grasshoppers and locusts that take over. And we have the fulfillment of all of these things also taking place on the ground. Science and religion have now agreed on one thing in this day and age, and that is that the earth will forever be changed. And scientists are even saying that now it's almost too late. There's no way to reverse this. It's over. And to add upon all of the insanity and to make sure that mankind has no excuse and to increase the craziness of what is taking place, you have the governments of the world coming out now and they are fulfilling yet more prophecies of Muhammad and the family of Muhammad and of Jesus and the Bible. Jesus said nothing is done in the darkness except that it will come to light. And we find now that in this day and age, all of the filth and the blackness and the darkness of all of these companies these clothes making companies, the clothing making companies that have uh, pedophilia in their commercials and in their advertisements and, and uh, these celebrities that would go to Jeffrey Epstein Island and these politicians and, 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 and all of that is being exposed. You have the collapse of the Roman Empire, the United States of America, uh, at the hands of the coming of the second Nero, uh, Donald Trump, you know, who begun this whole thing where now all of the dirty laundry is coming to the forefront. And each administration in the United States is only concerned with locking up and prosecuting the administration before the Republicans want to lock up the Democrats, the Democrats want to lock up and expose the Republicans, etc. You also have black projects coming to light. Government whistleblowers coming forward, exposing black operations that they had. Even the existence of extraterrestrials 
Now religion and science and government are all saying the same thing. They're saying that, hey guys, there really are extra dimensional beings that exist. Intelligences that are outside of this world. We don't live, uh, we don't, you know, we're not alone in the universe like we thought. Actually, you know, the Bible and the Quran, when they spoke about these entities, the jinn that are in the skies or the angels that travel up and down, uh, we have had for a very long time evidence of these entities. And they even came out with the fact that our governments have had top secret uh, files uh, that Bob Lazar exposed and other people came forward exposing that had to do with religion. And they were, they found this so strange and they were asked like, why would the government have top secret files pertaining to religion? It's because the governments had already made the connection between the extraterrestrials uh, or the interdimensional beings and between the what the the major western religions stated christianity judaism and islam about the existence of these creatures and they wrote in these files how these extra dimensional extraterrestrial creatures view human beings as being containers of the soul and how these beings have corrupted many of the religions that are on the earth for the sake of safeguarding the vessels, the containers, the human bodies in the way that they saw fit or to control the human populations. People have come out even accusing and saying that the Vatican itself has had a lot to do with the retrieval of unidentified flying objects. And we have in this day and age the appearance of many false claimants and false prophets just as biblical narration have stated. Biblical verses and narrations from Muhammad and the family of Muhammad. They all state that in the time of the reappearance of Jesus, and in the time of the reappearance of the, of the Mahdi السلام, that there would be many people that would come forward and they would claim to be prophets, or that they would claim to be the Messiah, but they wouldn't be him, they would be false. And the list could go on forever. We could make an episode that is 24 hours long, 48 hours long, we could probably talk from here until kingdom come about the narrations that have been fulfilled that indicate without a shadow of a doubt that we are living in the age of the rise. And if all these things come to pass, which most of them have already come to pass, but the remaining parts, civilization will collapse. And you could have a a uh, children of men type scenario where law and order governments in many parts of the world cease to function. One of the prophecies also that has come to pass and has actually been fulfilled, but is yet to be fulfilled even more, is the scarcity of food and the rising prices to the point that people would pay enormous amounts of money in order that they get a, you know, an ounce of wheat or a pound of barley. And we find that coming true, where banks in many countries are withholding the money that was deposited in there by the people. And you have currencies in many countries collapsing. And you have the inflation of currencies and the economies of different countries and the expectation of the experts that one day very soon everybody's going to wake up and their money is not going to be worth anything. Just like it happened in Lebanon and just like it's happened in Egypt. Egypt just over the past years, ever since the day that we walked out of Egypt until now. The pound, and you remember this Mustafa, the US dollar was worth... Um, back then about six, seven pounds. Yes. And now the US dollar is worth something on the black market like 40 pounds. The Egyptian people are starving. 
just as the the peoples of many of the nations that are out there uh, they're starving and they're going to continue to starve until the people return back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because everything that's happening and all of these prophecies that were foretold these are punishments from God but God only punishes a people by their own actions and their own doings so the punishment of God is not actually that he starves anybody but it is that he allows the people to do what it is that they want to do without his interference. That is the greatest of punishment. That a father allows the son to go forward and make his own mistakes. That is the greatest punishment. And so the son goes forward and he punishes himself. And because people strayed away from the imams and from the, the divinely appointed rulers by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they oppressed Imam al-Mahdi Muhammad ibn Hassan al-Askari who is supposed to be the imam of the time and who is supposed to be the Adam of this age to whom we should all prostrate to and obey, the custodian of the affairs of the planet, we placed them aside and we chose instead to follow the non-working scholars and the representatives of Satan and the tyrants and the callers to hellfire because we chose to elect our own leaders and to make up our own laws and our own rules, humanity now will taste the fruit of their own actions and they are tasting it. The wars that are taking place and that will take place is nothing more than the result of the people ex accepting and voting for these people that started the wars in power. And it's nothing more than the people staying silent and allowing them to continuously oppress their people. And so those people who believe in Imam al-Mahdi and those people who live in this day and age and those people whom um, Muhammad and the family of Muhammad wanted to protect, especially from the punishment of the Sufiani, whom also is here as well. And that's another prophecy that was fulfilled. For Muhammad and the family of Muhammad spoke about an evil individual from the sons of Abi Sufyan that would be the arch nemesis of the Mahdi and that he would raise a red flag that bears on it the sign of Islam. And we find that this tyrannical king who's described to a T in the narrations, this blonde, blue, red one who wears a cross around his neck and his chest has appeared in the Al Wadi al Yabis in Jordan, King Abdullah, the enemy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have also the fulfillment of the narrations from Muhammad and the family of Muhammad that stated that the Antichrist would appear also in this day and age. And you have that the Prophet Muhammad Ali describing the Antichrist and saying that he would come forward and he would be one-eyed. And it is no coincidence that you have the United States of America that iron beast, that antichrist that was mentioned in the book of Daniel and the vision of Daniel coming forward with its symbol being the one eye. That free Masonic state that praises and glorifies the one-eyed God that is on the back of its currency, the green God of money the God whom all of the celebrities over and over and over again in all of these images, in television shows, in magazines, in advertisements, all displaying the one eye in praise of him, the Antichrist, the Dajjal. How easy is it now to see all of these prophecies coming to pass? How blind is the person who sees all these signs coming to pass and questions the time that we live in? 
So what do we do in this time? Well, Muhammad and the family of Muhammad, they commanded the Shia. They said that if you happen to see these signs, if you happen to witness this, this age, then know that the Qa'im, the Mahdi, will be knocking on your doors. Travel to him through the clouds. Travel to him even if you have to crawl on ice. Go to him even if you are locked in a box. Break out of that box. Even if you are trampled dead, then arrive to him. Perhaps, just perhaps, the believers who end up reaching the cotton, the believers who end up unifying together and coming together as a collective force, perhaps they survive just because of that. In a world where everybody is for their own and neighbors are killing neighbors over bread or over a can of beans, perhaps in a, in a chaotic world where bullets are flying all over the place, electricity goes out, nuclear disaster has taken place, murder and rape is around every corner. Perhaps the companions of the Qa'im find protection in one another and they find a safe haven together. We'll stop at that point, inshallah, and we will meet again to discuss further um, very important topics that pertain to uh, the Mahdi Ali Salaam. Thank you guys for joining me. Thank you. 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 Thank you.